my name is Bruce Kane, and I'm the moderator here. I'm a professor of political science and director of the Bill Lane Center. And uh, I have something in common with both of these speakers for different reasons. Um, Olympia Snow is a graduate of Bates. I went to Bowdoin right down the road, uh, around the same time, as a matter of fact. And Jason lives in Bethesda. I still have a home in Bethesda, so. You do. We're bonding already. Uh, right. Maybe stop by. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, let me introduce the Senator and uh, Jason, and then we'll get started. I think the format will be, it sounds a little loud, is it? Yeah, I'm going to move it down on my tie. Is that better? Yeah. Um, I think the format will be that uh, we'll do a question and answer for a little period of time, and then we'll open it up to the students. We've fed them. They're in a good mood. Um, oh, that and, is important. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and uh, many of them uh, belong to Stanford in government. Uh, I see a lot of familiar faces, oh, yeah. and I know they're going to ask great questions. Mm -hmm. So we want, we're going to split it at about the 45 minute, and Steve Stedman um, will uh, signal us uh, when we make the transition. Okay. So uh, we have a lot of territory to cover. Let me first introduce our speakers, although in some sense I'm sure most of you in the audience know who they are. Uh, Senator Snow, as you know, uh, was in, uh, elected to the Senate in 94 and uh, had an 18-year career there. I thought what's interesting is that you served in both houses in the state legislature and uh, both houses That's of right. the federal government, which is uh, pretty unusual. And these days, people want to skip and go right to Congress. <laughs> and uh, there's a lot to be said for working your way up through the state legislature. Um, in her time in the Senate, she was chair of the Senate Committee on Small Business and Entrepreneurship. Uh, she was uh, um, first uh, woman senator to chair the Senate Armed Services uh, Committee, sub, uh, Committee Subcommittee on Sea Power. Um, another fact I did not know, that in 2005, she was named the 54th most powerful woman in the world. Uh, I think actually her ranking in terms of uh, her bipartisanship puts her much higher, closer to one, maybe. Uh, but uh, 54th in the world, I'd certainly take that. Um, and has Where was Madonna? What's that? Was, did Madonna make the list? I don't know. Did you beat Madonna or not? I don't know. I'm not sure. I didn't yeah. check it out. Well, well, they'll Google it and let us know. Um, at any rate, and she wrote a book called Fighting for Common Ground, How We Can Fix the Stalemate in Congress. And I think all of us know that... Uh, in her time in the Congress, she was uh, trying to, and the best she could to sort of uh, work bipartisan relations in the Senate. So uh, we're very pleased to have her. Uh, and then uh, Jason Grumet, if I'm pronouncing it properly, you are. Uh, is the founder and the president of the Bipartisan Policy Center. I've been there a couple times for conferences, and I know they do great work. Um, he founded this in 2007 with the former U.S. Uh, Senate Majority Leaders, Howard Baker, Tom Daschle, Bob Dole, and George Mitchell. And uh, before that, founded and directed the National Commission on Energy Policy, which turns out to be something that Stanford does a lot on over at the Precor Center, so a topic that uh, people are very interested in. So why don't we uh, get started? He's, uh, by the way, a graduate of Brown University and a JD from Harvard Law. Um, Let's, perhaps, Senator Snow, you could start us off and talk a little bit about the journey you took to get involved in this and um, why you think this is the right thing to do at, the, at this moment in time in history. Well, it, it is. It's critical and really what contributed to my decision not to seek re-election for a fourth term because I had you know, obviously prepared to run for re-election for more than two years, getting ready organizationally and financially. but. Um, and I came to the conclusion that the polarization would, would not be diminished in, in the short term. Um, and as I got closer to the day in which I have to submit my signatures, I realized you know, that it, was never, it wasn't going to change to the degree that we would get back to problem solving, which I happen to believe is the essence of public service. In fact, it stems back to the time when I was serving in the state legislature. You know, those were all sort of, you know, building blocks in terms of governing and legislating and learning how to solve problems and bringing both sides together. And so when I made that decision, I had, you know, obviously it shocked, uh, uh, you know, shocked my colleagues and the political establishment in Washington, people in Maine. 
Uh, but I decided to take the fight in a different direction outside of the institution of the Senate uh, because I didn't think it would change uh, from within. And that's why I, yes, I wrote the book. I joined the Bipartisan Policy Center where they had just launched the initiative on Commission on Political Reform, which I uh, ended up co-chairing with two former Senate Majority Leaders, uh, Trent Law, who's a Republican, and Tom Daschle, a Democrat, and two uh, former secretaries, uh, Secretary of Agriculture Dan Glickman in the Clinton administration, Secretary of Interior Dirk Kempthorne in um, President Bush's administration. And there were 29 of us who served on the commission. And we worked for a better part of a year and a half. We held four town meetings across the country, the first of which was actually here at the Reagan Library in California, but to explore the causes and consequences of the polarization. And we came up with 65 recommendations that were released in June, focusing in three areas, congressional reform, electoral reform, and encouraging participation in public service. And so now our goal is to implement some of them that we think are absolutely critical, uh, you know, both institutionally in Congress, changing Congress, like you know, five-day work week, um, and uh, yeah, unbelievably, that's true. <laughs> They're only in session for 112 days this year in the House, 110 days, at, uh, you know, in the Senate. So you can see uh, very minimal effort had been given, to, you know, to actually being in session to working on the issues that we know are out there. I said the legislative uh, inbox of Congress has piled up a number of issues uh, because of you know the failure to address any of them over the last few years. Um, we also talk about filibuster reform, restoring the committee process, um, and also allowing amendments to be offered on the floor of the Senate, which unbelievably was you know customary. I mean that's what the Senate's all about. It's a deliberative body. It was the world's greatest deliberative body. And so amendments are the way in which you bridge both sides, and that wasn't occurring either. So in any event, we are trying to drive those institutionally to get changes you know, between now and the opening day of the session of Congress, which is the first Tuesday in January. In addition, you know, Senator Mitch McConnell, who will be the new majority leader uh, in the Senate, has talked about these very issues as, as well recently. Uh, so hopefully we're moving in the, in the right direction. We're going to do everything we can to reinforce it. Beyond that, we should have open primaries, redistricting commissions, or other uh, issues that we are also proposing that we think can make a, a tremendous difference in the kind of, uh, you know, the polarization that exists. For example, in the House of Representatives, there are very few competitive seats. In fact, there was one study that came out recently, 85, you know, 85 percent, you know, of, this, of the House of Representatives has non -com, you know, a non-competitive congressional seat and basically only about 25 at most. In fact, Charlie Cook, the top political analyst, said there were only seven toss-up races in this last election uh, in the House of Representatives. Yeah, I think he was wrong about that, though. You do? Yeah. Yeah, well, he was. Uh, even in happened. California, we ended up yeah. having uh, four or five. I yeah. mean, uh, a number of races yeah. that we didn't see, uh, not just the Oast Berry, right. but, uh, you know, uh, races up and down the state anyway. So. I think he underestimated. Charlie Cook has a tendency to always miss the national waves because their methodology is all about interviewing uh, candidates and looking at specific numbers. So he systematically misses the waves. I've pointed this out, and I'm on his hit list. Yeah. He doesn't like oh, me, but he anyway. doesn't. Yeah. Well, <laughs> oh well. So Jason, talk a little bit about how uh, the um, the foundation uh, comes together and what role it would play in, mm -hmm. in this very ambitious agenda that Senator Snow is talking about. I can give you a little bit of the kind of creation myth of the Bipartisan Policy Center. And the you know, basic question that I had several years ago was whether we could add something to the kind of think tank industrial complex of Washington that would actually be different. And my sense looking around was, I'm going to take this down a little. Very powerful, thanks. There you go. There are kind of two types of organizations in DC. There are the tribal organizations, which are very important. The, you know, the Heritage Foundation, Center for American Progress, they play a critical role, but they're not there to put the deals together. They're there to define the issues. And then you have a lot of organizations that are so fascinated with their sense of objectivity that they don't want to sully it with relevance. In other words, they don't want to take their studies into the big mess, right? Because if you're going to put something together in a legislative body that is deeply divided, you are going to cut deals. You are going to make compromise. No one compromises because they want to. People compromise because they have to. 
And so there are a lot of organizations that just simply feel like that's not their role. Their role is to, in their view, tell the truth. And so my goal was to have an organization that kind of bridged that a little bit, that had you know, aggressive bipartisanship. So we are not centrist. We are not California Republicans. We are not postpartisan or transpartisan or metapartisan or any of the partisans other than bipartisan. Our view is it's a two-party system, by and large, and we want kind of proud, aggressive Republicans and proud, aggressive Democrats who are self-righteous in their own views and still willing to sit across the table from someone they disagree with and work out an agreement. Because that actually is the essential idea of our Constitution, right? I mean, the, our founders were actually remarkable optimists who created a system that can only work if people who disagree with each other found common ground. Uh, then the second thing we try to do is to combine the rigor of a think tank with very aggressive advocacy. So we proudly lobby, which is a wonderful profession that has been given a bad name by this administration and Jack Abramoff and, and many in between. But if you want to affect public policy, you have to influence public policy makers. And if you're honest about that, that's called lobbying. And so we have a you know, attached organization that advocates, if we're gonna have 20 people come together and try to come up with a detailed proposal on immigration reform, or climate change, or transportation, or healthcare, we're not gonna hit print and have the hubris to think that the world is just gonna fall to its knees and embrace our insights. We are gonna take that work to the Capitol. And so that's our imagination for how you actually influence outcomes. With regard to the Commission on Political Reform, you know, we had avoided the fixing government effort for a while because those tend to be patted on the head. You know, we felt like we needed to kind of break some plates and actually push some pretty aggressive policy issues first. But we then realized a couple years ago that nothing was making progress and that we had to address that foundation in order for the rest of the issues we care about to move forward. And so again, we brought together a group which um, I would call kind of authentically bipartisan. Very often the government reform efforts are center left efforts. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but they come out of the kind of post-Watergate kind of, you know, anxiety and um, ambivalence about government authority. Uh, and so as a result, if you're trying to influence an outcome in a polarized legislature and your effort is only kind of leaning towards one of the parties, you don't get a lot of outcomes. So we tried to put together a group that was truly diverse, people who had strong partisan investment. Um, and so as a result, we didn't agree on everything. You know, there are, some issues, I think, on campaign finance reform, there was a big debate. We were not able to get consensus across the board, and we came down and argued for transparency and donations. That's an idea that actually has pretty broad bipartisan support, which we think is actionable. And so now what we're going to do is to go advocate and lobby for these recommendations. We have a number of proposals on changing the congressional rules, which are a little bit below the surface, but incredibly important. It's the back of the game board that decides whether Congress is gonna actually collaborate or not. Um, we have a number of recommendations that are focused on the state level, and so you know, kind of true to our ethos, we are trying to combine that kind of analysis with real advocacy. Very good. Well, let's look at the congressional reforms to start with, because Senator Snow, we've had this hugely important election that has changed the leadership. Are we in a better position now, or a worse position with respect to what I take to be the thrust of your reforms, which is to sort of restore deliberative processes and the sort of uh, conventional order to uh, Congress to get rid of some, you know, fill in the amendment tree or, uh, you know, the, the decimation of the conference committee process. And if we sort of take all those things and say what's underneath all that, you're trying to get back to the way Congress was uh, conducted maybe 30 or 40 years ago where there was more of a kind of bipartisan collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, are we in a better position to get that now than we were, say, a month ago? I think we are um, because uh, based on the statements that have already been, you know, expressed by uh, Mitch McConnell, be the, the Republican majority leader in the Senate, um, and even uh, based on a uh, speech that he delivered early in the year, in January 2014, where he laid out, you know, his view of the Senate, its role, its, its historical role, the traditions and practices that had been virtually abandoned, and that um, there was an imperative to restore the United States Senate to have a robust committee process, as he said, robust amendment process on the floor. 
uh, to allow the rank and file to participate, that's critical because when you're talking about, you know, every center having the opportunity, whether you're in committee or on the floor, to offer an amendment is significant. You can't overstate the importance and the value of that, uh, you know, of that role because it gives one an opportunity to express his or her views on behalf of, the con of your constituents. Um, it also can improve the legislation, which is obviously important. It can bring both sides together. But if you have Republicans and Democrats each offering their own respective views and positions for a vote, and neither side prevails because they're likely, likely they won't, because it requires 60 votes in the United States Senate to get anything done, then it's you gotta decide whether or not you're willing to reconcile those differences to bridge the divide or take it to the next election. But everything's about taking the next election. So I think Mitch McConnell understands that. So he has the incentive, obviously, from the standpoint of being the new majority leader. Um, the Republicans need to, you know, refurbish, you know, their image and their positions. I mean, you know, obviously they've had, you know, some significant problems from the past. Uh, he wants to get things done. He's an institutionalist. And so with an eye towards 2016, in addition to all of that, is the fact that Republicans will have 24 seats up uh, out of the 33 that will be up for re -elect for election. Uh, so that puts him in a very difficult position. So he won't want to have, you know, a, a record of accomplishment. And besides, this, the mandate in this election, you know, wasn't really a vindication of, you know, Republicans. It was a repudiation of the status quo, right? right? It was what had failed. That's what this was all about. And so the Democrats, on the other hand, are obviously going to be looking to 2016. So there's an incentive there to get things done. And the president is in his final two years. And we'll be looking at his legacy and what he wants to achieve in the la final two years that could create a lasting impression. So for all of that, I think that there is more of an incentive getting it done. And we, as people, have to reinforce that and drive it and demand it you know, in the days ahead. Uh, that's going to be critical because not only is the uh, lame duck very important in setting the tone and the tenor, uh, but also it is really the launching pad for the next Congress, a new Congress, and how they get off the ground in those first six months will really determine, be the predictor for the remainder of, the, of that legislative session. You know, but a lot of, and I, that all makes a lot of sense, but it's very much centered on the Senate. Uh, the House, though, you know, uh, Boehner has a slightly mm -hmm. larger majority, but basically both the House and the Senate got to where they are because of this kind of reaction, counter-reaction between the obstructionists and the people trying to do things. So the reason that you, you know, fill up the amendment tree or the reason that you, uh, you know, don't have conference committees or that you, you centralize control and the leader's hand is because the other side's trying to obstruct. So a lot of this will depend upon how, what posture the Democrats take. If they if they're in a defensive posture, then it's going to be hard for both sides to lay down the guns, won't you think? Well, no, but yes and no. I mean, yes, it's true that Republicans, you know, obstructed through filibusters, but it was also true amendments were denied, and that was a response to that. So it was all of that. Exactly. Each employed the other's tactics, you know, unfortunately. I mean, they remember right. what, you know, the other did when they were in the majority or what the other did when they were in the minority. That's what you fear. So you don't know where this is all going in the final analysis, that's true. But I think that there is more of an, uh, you know, uh, an incentive now on both sides. In fact, I read an article today about moderate Democrats who you know, want you know, to be able to work on initiatives uh, that perhaps where they agree with Republicans on the overall issue but not on all the specifics to make it work again. So I think that's important. And obviously, what the House does, it will become critical right. uh, as, as well in, the, in this process. And both uh, Mitch McConnell and Speaker Boehner will have to synchronize you know, that agenda, and they'll have to synchronize the whole, whole process. And they'll have to determine whether or not they want to get something done or not, and how they want to be viewed you know, in this moment where they've really you know, got this window uh, to change things, both for the country and perhaps for, the, for the Republican Party as well. So let's let's try the campaign finance portion of it. I'll go to Jason and hand that one to him. I mean, 
there's, I think, within the academic reform community and some of the nonprofits that work on that, there's a kind of sense of hopelessness about this process at this moment in time, if I could characterize many of the conferences I've been to, largely because the court doctrine doesn't give you, you know, a lot of leverage over controlling outside spending, uh, controlling the amounts of money that are spent on outside groups. Um, so again, the same question, are we in a place to really do some of the things you want to do? I mean, even on disclosure, which it used to be an article of faith in the Republican Party that disclosure was the one thing they believed in, but we can't even seem to get back to a disclosure regime that we're happy with. We have money coming through the C4s going into super PACs that we can't trace. So we're, give us some Discuss. reason to hope, yes, yes. <laughs> that there's anything that can be done. So. Again, you know, I don't think either Olympia and I are suggesting the Congress is going to come in and kind of craft the Magna Carta, right? I mean, we think it's going to get better. It's admittedly a pretty low bar. Um, <laughs> but, and I'll talk about money in a minute, you know, this is about momentum, right? And, you know, you make little bits of progress and you have the experience of actually getting something done, which is quite exhilarating. Um, and it's an experience that a lot of members of Congress haven't had recently. So they don't actually have the appreciation of the art of the deal. It's you know, kind of a head rush to come up with a specific compromise and turn it into a, a national law. Um, but, you know, my view, um, and we didn't, as I say, get into this with as much consensus, so I don't want to suggest I'm speaking on behalf of all 29, is you have to kind of take your victim as you find it. Um, I know a lot of people who are desperately frustrated with campaign finance and want to have a constitutional convention. Tell me when that, you know, comes together, folks. Um, you know, one thing, for Mr. Doyle, you, when you open up the Constitution, you open the whole thing up. If you're going to actually have a constitutional convention, I would take the deal that we have uh, from the 1780s than uh, what we might get right now. But it's just not going to happen. And I think rather than whining about the Supreme Court, it's a reason they call it the Supreme Court. Everybody I know is absolutely outraged about something the Supreme Court has done. Um, suck it up and move on. Right, so there's going to be money in politics, and I think we simply have to accept that there's going to be money in politics. The question is, you know, what can we do about that? One is disclosure, and I think that is one area that is clearly um, allowed by the courts. It is worth noting that both political parties are starting to feel quite antagonized by this dark money. Candidates are losing control of their own narrative. Parties are losing control of their own narrative. So there is actually a growing desire to level the playing field and actually weaken these kinds of you know, dark money third party candidates. A number of politicians I have spoken to say, it's terrible. And what's terrible is not people putting ads against them, it's people running ads for them that do not reflect their actual imagination about the world and all of a sudden affiliated with this often toxic unpleasantness. Um, and so they feel like they have to raise more money not to combat the other side, but to combat their own side. And that's part of the, the money run. Um, I think the only other thing I'll say is that there are really two tremendous challenges with money in politics. One is all the money in politics. The second is how much time members of Congress have to spend getting the money. I mean, they don't spend a lot of time in DC. And as Olympia can tell you, when they're there, you know, th there was a, I think when the incoming class came in, they were instructed by leadership in the House to expect to spend roughly 30 hours a week fundraising, that they were supposed to put in you know, four hours on average every week, you know, seven days a week. Um, so there are ways you can you know, think about fixing that possibly, and some deals you might be able to put together. You know, there's a strong democratic desire for small grant matching, um, which would basically say that there'd be actually kind of public financing uh, to enhance the value of small gifts. Um, there's a pretty strong traditional Republican desire to raise the limit $2,300 um, hasn't been indexed to inflation, hasn't gone up in a while. Um, I have friends who think the thing to do is to lower the gift limit. If you lowered it by 50%, they would just spend twice as much time fundraising. There's a certain amount of money that people believe they have to have to protect themselves against the third parties or self-funded candidates. So, you know, come up with a modest public financing thing and raise the limit. You know, that would be an opportunity to potentially diminish the amount of time people are, are fundraising. But I think largely um, we should work on the things that we can fix and not spend too much time complaining about the Supreme Court. So, Senator Stone, let's try the electoral arena. Um, 
there's a lot of proposals in there, including redistricting reform. But one of the things that struck me is that there's also an emphasis on trying to get a fuller participation in elections and worrying a lot about that. Could you talk a little bit about that? And, um, and one of the frustrating things, obviously, is that so much of this is controlled at the state level and to some degree even at a lower level by a county registrar. So uh, do you have a way that we could sort of, because I think a lot of the suggestions you make are ones that lots of us would agree with, but how do we, how do we combat this kind of highly decentralized system and get them on, on the same page? Right. In fact, I quoted you in my book. Oh, well, there you on go. redistricting. Because <laughs> <laughs> I know you've done a lot of work on it. Um, well, first of all, it, you know, it, does, it does require a change. If we're going to ensure that more people are participating in elections, and particularly as well in primaries, because oftentimes what, has, what is happening now in, the, in these elections is that those who are nominated in the primaries ultimately are the ones who are the member of the House of the United States Senate. It's a predictor. And very few people are participating in the primaries uh, today. I mean, and the average you know, turnout has been 18 to, to 20 percent. Um, and I know the overall average for this election is like 36 percent, a little more than 36 percent. It's been the lowest since, I think, 1942 that I read, uh, which is stunning. I mean, considering at that time we were at war, and so here we are today at 36, you know, a little more than 36 percent, I think, is illustrative of the problems that we're facing. And too often people I know, are, you know, are turned off by, you know, the campaigns, the messages, the outside ads. Uh, that Jason was talking about, which have grown exponentially. We're seeing explosive growth in outside advertising, all of which, by the way, are negative. 90% of those ads that are run are negative. It's out to destroy the other side. So it doesn't do anything to enhance you know, unity <laughs> or you know, bringing people together, some kind of you know, approach on an issue that makes sense, but rather it is to you know, be engaged in destroying the, other, the opponent to the degree where it makes it virtually impossible to, to survive an election. So I think you know, we, it, we had great debates in, in the bipartisan policies and the commission itself on some of these issues, but we think that redistricting is something that, frankly, people can initiate. You know, in some states, it, you, can bring it on, you can put it on the ballot, um, or you have to get your, your state legislature to you know, to change the laws. And what we're saying is, is to have both parties buying into it. In other words, having the support of both parties, but establishing, you know, much more, uh, you know, objective criteria, you know, whether it's on geography or, you know, the compactness of the districts and so forth. And what's happened here in California, for example, you've had um, a commission as well on redistricting that has worked. So I think that, um, that people have to initiate these actions and demanded of their legislators and their elected officials to get it done. The same is true with open primaries because of the low participation rate. Washington Post indicated back in July, at that point in the primaries process, only 100, uh, out of the 123 million people who could vote in a primary, only 18 million had. Um, and then we had some primaries in September. We were also proposing a single congressional primary day similar to the presidential Super Tuesday, uh, because that way you, you know, increase the awareness and enhance the participation uh, and involvement um, of, the, of the candidates and of the races themselves that they're actually happening. Because, you know, they span from March until September otherwise. Right. So having a single congressional primary day, I think, would elevate the interest and the awareness, the media focus, that I think is also crucial in terms of you know who is selected in these primaries, but very few people turn out. We need to encourage broader participation in the primaries because they're playing an outsized and disproportionate you know role um, in the electoral system. You know, uh, with respect to redistricting, as you know, there's a Supreme Court uh, case right now that's considering whether it's even constitutional to allow anybody other than the legislature to draw the line. So it may be taken off the board by judicial mm -hmm. action. I know I've spent the last couple of years uh, helping Arizona defend yeah. its uh, mm -hmm. independent redistricting commission. You worry sometimes that the beast will eat the mechanism. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so we'll see. Um, let's do one more question and then go out to the audience. Uh, Jason, 
Uh, I know that one of the areas that you guys are working on is uh, sort of public service and getting younger people involved and um, you know, perhaps talking a little bit about that. I will just mention that um, the Haas Center, which is one of the co-sponsors of this, has uh, very ambitious plans to sort of uh, grow their public service and uh, programs, including some of the innovative programs that have been tried elsewhere, like you know, having people do a year of service before they come and various other uh, programs, uh, expanding the number of people that will be on internship. So it's very much on our radar screen here at Stanford, uh, where the drift in recent years has been in the direction of, shall we say, the private sector and the internet and writing an app and making millions or whatever. <laughs> and uh, we're trying to broaden the perspective and look at other things you could do with your life other than write another dating app. So, uh, <laughs> which, which for some is a public service, <laughs> I think it's fair to say. It's, it's a kind of public service. <laughs> so this is um, an area where I think we believe there really has to be a kind of a partnership between what government can do and the, and the private sector, and probably more of a lean on the private sector. I think we were trying to really suggest a couple of things. Um, one is that working in government is actually still a form of public service. So we did a poll with USA Today and it turned out that of the demographic on this side of the room, vast majority expressed a desire or commitment to be engaged in public service, you know, 85% or so. And then um, when asked to kind of identify types of public service, only I think it was like 16 or 17 percent thought that working in government, in fact, was an expression of public service. And so I think what we've been trying to do is to um, kind of reanimate this notion that you know, government is good and it needs good people to be part of it. Um, the other thing that you know, we've thought about, and it's interesting to hear what your Haas Center is imagining, is you know, how, to, how to create meaningful incentives, right? Most of the incentives for public service um, are individual. There are really very few external incentives. The notion that universities um, might give people some extra credit when it comes to applications if people had participated in a year of public service, I think would be profoundly motivating, looking at the crazy stuff you all shoved on your resumes in order to get in here. Um, so there are a number of ways in which institutions that have that kind of commitment um, can, in fact, I think, create those types of incentives. But you know, as Olympia will uh, say many different ways, and we certainly all embrace this, it's about figuring out what engages people. And you know, the, the dating app is actually a worthwhile um, metaphor because you know, this is not going door to door and knocking anymore. And you know, things like TurboVote, I don't know if any of you are familiar with that, which is a really simple but terrific way of helping people get registered. We're starting to find that you know, the Facebook communities, when your friends start to say that they voted, that seems to motivate people. It's about being part of something. And if the larger narrative of our nation is not making people feel part of something, then the question is, well, what are community-based efforts that in fact could provide that?